Thank you. It's a privilege to be here today. I'm going to talk to you a bit, a bit about the science of climate change and water management. I'm a scientist and, and a, a hydrolog hydrologist, so uh, I'm bringing that slant to it. So I'm going to be talking about Reclamation's role in managing western water in an evolving climate, including Reclamation's mission, first of all, um, observe climate changes, and then, and then our approaches to managing water as the climate changes. So Reclamation, it's uh, an, uh, established in 1902 to promote, promote development of the western United States. It's best known for its 600 dams, power plants, and canals it constructed in the 17 western states. It's the largest wholesaler of power of water in the country and the second largest hydroelectric producer in the western United States. Its uh, mission is to assist in meeting the increasing water demands of the west while protecting the environment and the public's investment in these uh, important structures. So we're, we're quite well known for, for instance, the Hoover Dam. Um, and increasingly, we're uh, uh, addressing environmental concerns, endangered species, and the like. So we've observed quite a bit of hydrology and vegetation changes uh, already. We've seen less spring snowpack because of warmer temperatures. We've seen earlier green up, uh, and we've seen um, less or more rainfall or changes in rainfall and of course earlier snow melt due to um, higher temperatures. So these are observed changes we've already encountered. Um, what are the implications of those changes for water, uh, water supplies, demands, and operating constraints? For supplies, warming means less snowpack and less controllable water supply and more landscape evapotranspiration and then less runoff. Uh, precipitation changes, we've seen both positive and negative, so that uh, um, depends on where you are. Demands on water, warming tends to increase irrigation demands um, and also increase uh, demands on electricity. Operating constraints, we have in-stream flow requirements, uh, endangered species, for example. We have a need for uh, cold water supplies for certain uh, fish species. We also have a need to protect for floods. So how is climate change going to affect that? In some cases, we expect um, more severe uh, storms, but also higher levels of evaporation, so we may actually get more flood protection in certain areas. So the key challenge for the, my organization is to understand how climate variability and change can affect water supply in the West and demand in the West and how reclamation's delivery of water given operational constraints that I just talked about. We want to bring the best uh, science and technology to bear on the needs of water resource managers and address goals of internal programs and authorizations where climate change is a factor. So we have a number of different initiatives. They're summarized here. Um, in 2009, Congress passed the Secure Water Act, which requires federal agencies that conduct water management to have a responsibility and take a leading role in assessing risks to water resources and to develop adaptation actions. Um, we have an interagency group of uh, climate change and water working group that um, has a, quite a few different agencies involved in it. They've concluded in a 2009 document that climate change is occurring, effects um, differ regionally, water resource management could be affected, hydroclimate conditions are becoming non-stationary, which means the past isn't necessarily a predictor of the future, and climate change is one of many challenges uh, facing water managers. Um, and then we have a, a program called Water Smart that establishes landscape cooperation, landscape conservation cooperatives, climate change science centers, and basin studies, which I'll tell you just a bit about. So we won't need to find out how to take climate predict projections and figure out how to um, find their implication on operations. So we take um, climate projections, such as those done by the IPCC, the International uh, uh, climate change groups that run models across the world and tell us what the projections will be. Um, we want to bring those into downscaling because a lot of times these grid cells are quite large. We want to know locally what's going on. And then we need to turn the climate simulations into something like a hydrologist would understand. What, what's the impact on the water? So we run it through a, a watershed model and finally um, uh, interface with operations and understand how changes in that watershed model that it predicts will impact operations. So let me show you just a bit on how we do that. So we've taken 112 different climate model projections, an ensemble of climate model project projections, used a something called the VIC hydrology model, and um, uh, put together 
estimates of, high, of climate changes for um, most of the western watersheds in the United States and written several reports. So uh, reports on, on how these changes are going to occur. These reports are available on the web. The Secure Water Report um, to Congress in 2011 is the most recent. Um, so here's an example of what's in those reports. So we, we can see a projection out to 2100 of both um, uh, runoff and um, this is a weekly runoff and minimum runoff. So uh, for the Colorado River, this is just one of those eight basins we looked at. So we can see that um, maximum runoffs most are, are generally um, staying fairly constant, but minimums are decreasing. If we look at um, change through time of maps of the Colorado River Basin, temperature is generally increasing through the uh, 2020s to 2070s. Precipitation is a mixed bag. The north is increasing and the south is decreasing, and snowpack is also decreasing significantly. Um, if we look at this differently in terms of seasons, uh, we can see there's, there's changes in the seasons um, in terms of uh, runoff, uh, the south generally getting uh, drier and the north perhaps a little bit wetter. But if we look at seasonal, we see big changes in seasons. So the winter season, we're seeing a lot more runoff occurring um, during the winter, which we'd expect usually that to be in snowmelt. And in the summer, big decreases. So uh, there's a lot of variability within the season, not just with the averages. Um, future work in this is to analyze demands um, with legacy tools um, and climate projections, including looking at the next generation of climate projections that come out, and we'll have another report back to Congress in the next five years. Um, we're also then wanting to look at how these projections that we have, these are different changes in the way that climate will affect water resources, how they'll affect the various different um, missions that uh, Reclamation has from hydropower, water quality, water deliveries, recreation, and the like. So the second um, kind of thing I want to highlight is our uh, basin studies program. So we're looking at uh, this is a, another example of from the Colorado River, although we're doing basin studies all over the West, where we're trying to reach out to stakeholders from all different sectors: uh, hydropower, recreation, ecosystem, uh, water deliveries, uh, and even tribes. Um, to understand how the water demand and supply will change for this and how we might be able to meet that in the future. So if we look in the past, uh, back to 1914, um, in the Colorado River Basin, we have an annual supply here in the red. It's highly variable. And we have um, the water use, which is increasing um, through time. And what we're seeing is that in this era, in the last uh, 20 years or so, we've reached an equilibrium between water supply and demand. So we're, we're rel roughly balanced. Sometimes, like in the uh, last 10 years, we have significant, uh, where we have a significant drought, drought. Uh, our demand is actually above our supply. We're able to do that because of the large reservoirs on the Colorado can store about four years of Colorado River storage. So we take years when the supply is plentiful, and then we can use it in years that it's not. So what we're looking at is a number of different scenarios. So these are supply scenarios. We have different ways of estimating what the supply might be in the future. We don't want to use just one. One of them is that downscaled climate model projection. Other ones are to look at um, long-term past histories, sediment studies or tree ring studies. Um, and then another one is to assume stationary and assume the, the past is going to continue on and be uh, the, sim the future will be similar to the past. So that's how we look at different scenarios for water supply. For water demand, we talk to the stakeholders. We understand what the current trends are. We understand how the economy might affect the demand for water. And we try to understand how um, the different sectors will use water in the future. And what we come up with is a, a bunch of different possibilities. Um, we, look, we have quite a few different um, uh, supply possibilities and quite a few different uh, uh, demand possibilities. And we can, um, then you can see we end up with uh, many, many different possible future scenarios for how supply can meet demand. It looks a bit like this uh, uncertainty cone. So today we know exactly what the supply and demand are. But as we go out into the future, that becomes uncertain. And depending on which one of those scenarios plays out, we may take a different track into the future of how the supply and demand is reached. And we end up with this cone of uncertainty where the possibilities could 
end up anywhere within that cone of, uh, of uh, uncertainty. So we can change this uncertainty. We can um, modify the way that we look at demand, or we can improve our estimates on the supply, and we can narrow this cone, which is very useful for water management. So that's all I have. Thank you very much.